thank you for including our paper on the program. This is joint work with David Schwarzstein at Harvard Business School. Um, so the motivation for this paper is that there's great interest in studying and understanding racial disparities in access to credits and various other economic and financial outcomes with the hope of actually ultimately like reducing and eliminating these disparities. Now, unfortunately, historically, our access to data on racial and ethnic identity has mostly been limited to uh, mortgage applications and to some survey data with the surveys being potentially costly to conduct and maybe not fully representative of broad population. And so given recent developments in machine learning algorithms, there is also growing use of machine learning algorithms to predict race and to use predicted race uh, to study disparities in various outcomes in settings where we previously didn't have access to race information. And so in this literature, while there is some recognition that measurement error in these predicted race can affect, can, can introduce bias into our estimates of disparities, we still don't have really great understanding of how much of an issue this can be, in what kind of settings, for what kind of purposes, and what kind of research questions. And so this is what we're gonna be trying to do in this paper is to think a little bit more carefully about how much measurement error there is, what are the implications for measuring disparities and understanding uh, their drivers? Uh, so the agenda is uh, going to consist of three parts. First, I'm going to talk about kind of like a model to quantify bias due to measurement error. I'll then talk about the algorithms that we're going to consider. Okay, um, and then kind of like use racial disparities in the Paycheck Protection Program as a setting in which we can see sort of like how the conclusions we draw might depend on um, whether we use actual race or predictions of these models. Okay. So I call it a model, but it's really exposed like embarrassingly simple algebra, uh, but it was helpful for us to clarify our thinking and so, uh, about sort of like what happens when we use predicted race. Now I'll start to develop intuition. I'll start with a case of just two groups. And since our empirical analysis, the biggest disparity is going to be for Black-owned firms, I'm going to refer to the two groups as Black and White. Okay. We're going to have some algorithm for uh, predicting who is Black. Okay. The algorithm is going to, be, is going to have prediction uh, precision gamma. So out of those predicted to be Black, fraction gamma is actually going to be Black. Right? And it's going to have recall theta. Uh, so uh, theta percentage of those who are black are going to be identified as such by the algorithm. Okay. So given this characterization of the algorithm, we can straightforwardly calculate the measured outcome for those predicted to be black, right? And essentially weighted average between true positives. So blacks who are classified as such by the algorithms and false positives so whites who are predicted to be black. Okay. So the measured outcome here is actually going to be just the scaled version of the true outcome, which is going to be precision multiplied by the average outcome for black, right? So if our precision is on the order of like 65%, which is like common for these algorithms, right? Then our estimated outcome for black is going to be biased downwards by 35%. We also have measured outcome for those predicted to be white. It's going to be weighted average essentially between uh, true negatives, right? And false negatives. So the false negatives are blacks who are identified uh, as white or who the algorithm fails to identify as black, right? Uh, so the measured outcome for white is going to be um, a function of the algorithm's precision, recall, and population share of the minority group. And of the outcome for the minority group, right? So essentially, what's going to happen is that some blacks are going to be classified as white, and this is going to affect our measurement of the outcome for white, sort of like the baseline category relative to which we're going to be measuring disparities. Right? Uh, so both the measured outcome for the group of interest for the blacks is going to be affected, also for uh, for our baseline whites, right? 
And then we have expression for uh, the measure disparity, which um, potentially actually doesn't even have to have the same sign as the true disparity. Um, although in the true group case, it's unlikely that the sign is going to be um, opposite of the true disparity because the, the precision will typically be larger than uh, minority population share alpha. Okay. Now we can generalize this to uh, N groups, right? Uh, with the N group case, we're going to have, uh, we're going to denote uh, by gamma uh, IJ is going to be the probability that someone who is predicted to be of type J is actually of type I. Okay. Uh, given this notation, we can calculate the measured outcome for those predicted to be of type I right, as a weighted average across all of the different groups, right, with the weight of group J being their share out of all of the agents who are predicted by the algorithm to be of type I. Now, what this shows, right, is that the measured disparity for a given group depends not only on the algorithm's precision in predicting that group, but essentially on the global properties of the algorithm, on its accuracy in classifying all groups, on the population shares of the different groups, right, and on the disparities or average outcomes for the different groups, right, and in particular, you're not even guaranteed to have um, the measure disparity is not even guaranteed to have the same sign as the true disparity. And sometimes we can find disparities even when they don't exist uh, in, in the data, right? So the simplest example would be three groups. I'll call them white, black, and Asian, right? So suppose that uh, for the Asians, the algorithms has perfect accuracy, right? And that there is no disparity relative to whites. Now, for the blacks, the algorithm might have like low uh, accuracy, and there might be a disparity for black. Okay. What's going to happen when we try to use the algorithm and then measure disparity for Asians is that uh, the algorithm will, will misclassify some blacks as whites. That's going to affect our measure of the baseline for whites, and then relative to this biased measure of the average outcome for whites, we're going to find a disparity for Asian that is opposite and sign of the disparity for blacks. Um, more generally, we're going to use this um, equation um, to actually calculate sort of like given an accuracy of the algorithm, we can try to figure out, okay, like how much of what the measured disparity will be assuming that prediction errors are um, random and are not, not correlated with form characteristics. Right. Uh, we can also think about interaction term and estimation of interaction terms. What do we mean by interaction terms is essentially cross-sectional variation in uh, disparities. Okay. Uh, so an example would be like we might run a regression right of some outcome in our example, it's going to be PPP take up on um, racial dummies and their interactions with the racial bias or with uh, whether a firm has previous bank uh, bank relationships. Right? And so we might want to ask, are despair, is the effect of existing borrowing relationships stronger for different groups? Right? Now, as long as this variable that we're interested in in the interaction term is a binary one, Right, uh, then the interaction term in this kind of regression is going to be the difference in the estimated disparities within the two subsamples. Okay. So, for for example, the, the estimated disparity within the sample with existing bank borrowing relationships versus the subsample uh, without existing bank borrowing relationships. Um, and what this shows is that our estimates of interaction terms. <laughs> are going to be affected by relative accuracy in the two subsamples. Okay. So if we're interested, for example, in understanding like our racial disparity is greater in areas with greater racial bias, right? and we split areas into high versus low racial bias, then what might happen is that in areas with high racial bias, the algorithm might perform significantly better, right? perhaps because there's greater segregation 
Um, and if the algorithm performs significantly better in those areas, then the measure the measurement error bias is going to be smaller, right? We're going to detect larger disparities in areas with greater racial bias, right? Uh, but this is not necessarily because of racial bias itself, but because it's correlated with algorithm accuracy, right? Uh, so the two algorithms that we're going to look at, the first one is the Bayesian improved first name, surname, geocoding, BIVSG. Uh, it's a naive based algorithm uh, that's commonly used in the literature. Um, it's very easy to implement. You don't need to train it. It's just like you just use essentially base formula. Um, it's naive because it um, essentially assumes conditional independence between uh, characteristics. Um, we're going to have two versions of uh, BIFG as long as, as well as our second algorithm. Uh, and the difference is that we're going to be using either population shares at the zip code level or at, a, at the more narrower census block group level. Okay? And the idea is going to be to see how much accuracy you gain from using narrower uh, location information and how that subsequently affects uh, your uh, estimates and the kind of analysis that you might want to do. Okay. Uh, the second algorithm is a random forest algorithm. It's going to use the same features as BIVG, but effectively what it's going to do is relax the conditional independence assumption and essentially allow for flexible correlation between the different uh, features in the, uh, in the data. Now, there are more sophisticated algorithms that you can train to squeeze out like, you know, last ounce of predictability and increase your accuracy a little bit. Ge but generally, as long as these algorithms are gonna be using same features, so essentially name and location information, uh, they're not gonna be, get, you know, dramatically better than the accuracy that I will show you. And they're gonna be subject to the same issue that we're gonna highlight that they're using information that we might subsequently include in our, in our regression analysis. Uh, so the setting in which we're gonna compare the performance and this, the choice of setting is driven by the previous work that we've done on racial disparities in the Paycheck Protection Program, right? So this was like government's part of the government's response to the COVID pandemic. We distributed these forgivable loans to small businesses. Uh, in the aggregate, the government gave out almost uh, a trillion dollars in small loans. Um, and so it's important to understand whether there were racial disparities in, in this context. Okay. Uh, so in our previous paper, we kind of come up with a setting how to study disparities in access to PPP. Okay. And the main one is to look at Florida restaurants. And so the idea is that Florida restaurants kind of constitute a well-defined population of eligible borrowers. And because Florida border registration data includes racial identity, we can actually figure out who owns the restaurant. And we also have rich characteristics from Yelp that we can include in our conditional uh, regressions. Right. And so we're gonna use this setting to see how uh, self-reported race compares with predicted race, All right? Uh, so first of all, here is a summary of essentially accuracy of these different algorithms within Florida restaurant sample. Okay. Uh, the first row in each, um, here reports like recall, and the second row reports precision. Um, for blacks, the algorithms don't do all that well. At best, we essentially get 60% uh, recall and 60% uh, precision. Okay. Uh, using CBG population shares results in significant improvements in precision, but not so much in recall. Okay? So intuitively, if I know that you live in a zip code with high black population share, I'm pretty confident that you're black. Okay? But using this narrow population shares doesn't help me with my recall with the fraction of blacks who I'm able to classify correctly because many of them live in areas that don't have high black population share. Um, I should also note that we report for kind of, as a benchmark, uh, a random forest that uses only name information and not 
uh, performs quite poorly, uh, in particular in terms of precision. Okay. Uh, this first table reports the results using self reported rates. Right? Uh, in the first column, we see that black owned uh, firms are 26.2 percentage points less likely to get a PPP loan compared to white owned firms. Uh, columns two and three add uh, zip and CBG fixed effects. Column four adds all of our controls like restaurant size, age, does it have existing bank relationship, et cetera. Um, so location and form characteristics explain about two thirds of the total disparity for blacks. But even when we look at within a CBG, Black and white owned restaurants com observably comparable. Black owned restaurants have significantly lower PVP take up. Okay. Now, this next table uh, reports the, uh, what would be met, um, our estimates using equation three in the paper of what would be measured disparities for black owned firms if prediction errors were uncorrelated with firm characteristics. And so if that were the case, then given the accuracy of these algorithms, we would find measured disparities that are only half of actual disparities. Now, prediction errors are in fact are correlated with location and firm characteristics. And so when we run regressions of uh, PPP take up on just predicted race, what we find is that unconditional disparities for blacks are generally underestimated by 20 to 35 percent. Okay. So what happens is that even though the algorithm has measurement error, it picks up basically black owned firms in areas with worse outcomes that on average have worse outcomes. Okay. Now, when we include ZIP uh, and CBG fixed effects, right? Um, the estimates of conditional disparities are underestimated by about 50% uh, for both actually Blacks and uh, Hispanics. Okay. So significantly greater underestimation when we start looking at conditional disparity. And so what's happening here is that the algorithms get their accuracy from cross-sectional variation across locations. Okay. Uh, but if you want to ask within a given location, are there disparities, the way that the algorithms essentially they fall back on name based out information that so for two people within the same location, they're mostly using name, using name is much less accurate matter of race. And so if we're trying to ask the question, are there disparities within location, we're going to have much uh, significant underestimation of uh, such conditional disparity. Okay. Uh, having said that, uh, in the, at least in this particular context, uh, predicted race actually tends to overestimate uh, disparities for Asia. Uh, the other thing that I would note here is that with CBG fixed effects, there is no benefit of using CBG instead of zip code population shares. Okay. So the zip, the fixed effects effectively undo the extra accuracy that we get from getting more precise location information. Um, let me show you just a little bit on um, evidence on prediction errors essentially being correlated with location and some kind of characteristics. The way we look at this is we run our regressions, but interact actual race, say black, with your predicted to be black or your predicted to be non-black. Okay. When we run, uh, un when we look at unconditional disparities, blacks who are predicted to be black have significantly worse outcomes than blacks who are not predicted to be black. Okay. Except when we use name-based algorithms where there is basically no location information, then uh, there is no difference. All that matters is that you are actually black. Okay. When we turn to conditional disparities, so with location and firm characteristics, what matters again is your actual race, not what the algorithm predicts you to be. Okay. So within the location, again, like the prediction errors are much more random, and then it matters again, like the actual race rather than algorithm's prediction. And we can also show that uh, 
blacks who are predicted to be black by the algorithm tend to have uh, worse kind of characteristics. So they are in zip codes with fewer bank branches per capita. Uh, they have lower in zip codes with lower household income. They are smaller. Uh, and they are less likely to have existing bank relationships compared to Blacks who are not predicted to be Black right now. Right. Right. Uh, finally, let me show to you the accuracy of BIVG in different settings. So we can use the Florida data because Florida has a wealth of data on you know, different like mortgage brokers, CPAs, et cetera. We can uh, compare the accuracy of the algorithm in the different settings. And what you see is that it, uh, there is significant variation depending on what kind of setting you look at in the accuracy of the algorithms. And I think that this is important because these algorithms were tested and kind of developed using voter registration and mortgage application data where their accuracy is not terrible, but we're increasingly applying them in contexts uh, that are more specialized than where their accuracy might be lower uh, than uh, in the settings where they were originally tested. Okay, so we kind of like uh, suggest that we must use caution in using these algorithms in normal settings, right? Um, so I'll stop right here. I'm out of time. I'll just say that, you know, this is the beginning of kind of like our efforts to understand these issues. And PPP is just one context that we were able to do this, but we're hoping to apply this to, um, to see in other settings how much of a difference it makes. And the ultimate goal would be to provide suggestions for researchers of what they can do to kind of undo the bias due to measurement error. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Really excited to be discussing what I think is a timely and a valuable warning uh, for all the things that can go wrong when we use an algorithm's guess of race rather than observe race to try to think about differences between groups. The paper has a lot of detailed results uh, using some pretty rich data, but I want to focus on what I see as the three high-level uh, issues or problems or things that can go wrong when you rely on these sort of measures. The first, uh, let me see if I can get the clicker, uh, is not going to surprise anyone, but these prediction algorithms aren't perfect. Uh, any algorithm you have or any standard algorithms is going to guess that some white individuals are black and some black individuals are white. So we have a measurement error issue. Um, and as a result, if we just naively throw the guess of the algorithm on the right-hand side, you're gonna get some sort of bias. And if we're willing to assume that the prediction errors are random, we know exactly what that bias is gonna look like. So here I'm taking the white-black gap uh, from the author's data. Basically, you're gonna get a standard sort of attenuation. The red bar captures the actual disparity when you see race. And the hollow bars capture what you'd expect if prediction errors are random with these various algorithms, a bunch of attenuation. So we're going to get biased. We have measurement error. We're used to that problem. The second issue, which I think is a little more insidious, is if you actually take the predict prediction of race and put it on the right-hand side, the attenuation we see is smaller than what you'd expect if those prediction errors were random. This tells us that not only do we have prediction errors, but that those prediction errors are correlated with the thing we're interested in. And in fact, the authors show pretty convincingly, for example, that among Black entrepreneurs, those that are predicted to be Black have worse outcomes than those that are predicted to be white. This is a problem because not only do we have measurement error, not only do we have bias, but we no longer know the magnitude or even the sign of that bias ex ante. We're not sure what that bias is going to look like and not gonna be able to back it out so easily. The third issue, which is sort of a combination of those first two, is that if you start trying to compare conditional disparities to unconditional disparities, think about the role that observables play in these disparities, you might come to very different conclusions if you use the algorithm guess versus if you use observed race. This is because when you condition on something like location, what you're doing is changing the predictive quality of your algorithm within a location versus across all locations, and also changing the degree to which that prediction error is correlated with your outcome. So you're going to come to some very different conclusions. The worst case is something like this example from their data, where if you have observed race, you look at the unconditional disparity and then you include zip code fixed effects. 
you see about an 18% reduction in the disparity. Whereas if you're using the algorithm, it's going to look like zip codes explain almost half the disparity. You're going to come to very different conclusions about the role these observables play. So just to summarize, first issue, we're kind of used to, we have measurement error, we're going to get bias. The second issue, though, is that it's hard to even interpret or sign that back bias because those prediction errors may be correlated with the outcomes we're interested in. And the third, as I said, kind of the result of these first two, is that we might come to very different conclusions about the role of observables if we rely on these conclusions. So I think this is an important caution for academics, for regulators like the CFPB, for really anyone who's forced to rely on these kind of naive, uh, re rely naively on these measures of race. The paper is written as a warning. Uh, it's telling us about all the things that can go wrong when you use this. Obviously, that feels like it's taking a bunch of our toys away. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not that fun to be told you can't use these things anymore. So I want to spend the time I have here trying to think about. I believe everything the authors are saying. If this stuff is true, what can we do about this? If we're in these contexts where we do have to rely on algorithmic, algorithmic measures of race. So the first one, I actually think this one's pretty straightforward. We have measurement error. If we're willing to uh, assume that the errors are random, we know how to deal with the bias. We just need decent measures of the precision and recall of our algorithm. An important caution the authors raise is this really depends on your sample. You can't take the quality of your algorithm and mortgage data and use that to apply to Florida, Florida restaurants or use Florida restaurants and apply that to manufacturing or another industry. You really need to understand what's going on in your sample. I think the thing is, relative to a lot of measurement error issues, though, getting decent validation for data for race is relatively decent. It's not totally easy. It's not for free. We have do have a lot of data with observed race. You should start to be able to get an idea, even if it's not totally in sample, about how high quality uh, your data is or how, how high quality your algorithm is. Once we have that understanding, once we understand the misclassification, we can back out pretty easily what the bias is, either a la David Card's paper uh, on the misclassification of union status, or by just using the algorithm applied to comply with probabilities versus the discrete classification on the right hand side. It's still an important warning. Nobody in this room is allowed to just throw race on the right hand side naively anymore. You have to think about this, you have to back it out. The second issue, I think, is a lot trickier. Uh, this is a really difficult bias to unpack, and it's a pretty tough sort of endogeneity issue at the end of the day. We have a correlation between our errors and these outcomes, and I'm not clever enough to think up a cool IV strategy that's going to let us get just the right point estimate. It's tough. Maybe someone can come up with something clever, but I don't have one. But I do want to emphasize that we already have some decent bounding exercise that I think can pretty tightly help us understand roughly where the disparities are going to lie in these contexts. So I want to point to this uh, El Zion paper that came out in January of this year. Uh, this looking at a similar sort of context. They, they measure disparities in tax audits between white and black or between black and non-black individuals and have to deal with similar issues thinking about algorithmic race. Their approach is really straightforward. To bound the actual disparity, they propose two really straightforward estimators. The first they call a linear disparity. This is just regressing your outcome on the probability your algorithm predicts that an individual is black. Alternatively, they propose what's called a probabilistic disparity. This is basically just the difference in probability weighted units. The cool thing is, though, that if a certain condition holds, these two simple estimators are going to bound the true disparity. And that condition is basically on the expected value of some conditional covariances. The first one says that the covariance between your outcome and race, conditional on your prediction, <laughs> has a certain sign. And the second is that the covariance between your outcome and the prediction of race, conditional on actual race, has a certain sign. Those are a little bit difficult to back out just looking at it quickly. But a simple example, both of these are going to be negative if Black entrepreneurs have worse outcomes than white entrepreneurs, conditional on the algorithm prediction. And second, if within race, within Black entrepreneurs and within white entrepreneurs, those with a higher predicted probability of being Black have worse outcomes. What's that going to look like? This is just simulated data. I just made this up to give you an example of this. If you have a situation like this, both those conditions are going to hold. 
Blue dots represent black entrepreneurs, red dots represent white entrepreneurs. The first condition is going to hold if at a given predicted probability of being black, the blue outcomes are below the red outcomes on average. In other words, if the blue line is below the red line, that first condition is going to hold. So at a given prediction, the black out, uh, entrepreneurs have worse outcomes than the, red, uh, the white entrepreneurs. <laughs> the second prediction that just says within these categories, the slope is negative. That is, those with a higher predicted probability of being black have worse outcomes. That's a negative sign on that second condition. Now, the authors already explicitly show pretty convincing evidence of this second condition. And in their data, they could also go and tell us about the first condition or just ex ante, understanding how these algorithms work. <laughs> In a new context, even if you don't have the high quality data that the authors have, I think you can make some predictions about what this is going to look, look like. If you have these two together, you can get a pretty tight bound on what the actual disparity is going to look like, even in the presence of this sort of mission. So that's the first two. I have 30 seconds left. The last one dealing with uh, the role of observables and overstating this. I don't have a good solution to this problem. It's a really complex combination of the interaction across observables. But I do want to say that I think it's important to ask why we're so obsessed in these sort of contexts with thinking about the role observables play. I think implicitly or even explicitly, we're often saying something like, look, if these observables explain a large fraction of the disparity, it really isn't so bad. Or if once we throw enough controls at it, the disparity is insignificant, then this isn't really about race. It's about those observables. I think that way of thinking misses the fact that all these observables are fundamentally endogenous to race itself, where you live, how big your firm is, whether or not you have a banking relationship, that's a function of race and not the other way around. So understanding these conditional comparisons, I think is a lot trickier than we often give it credit for. As a matter of time, I'm not a big Twitter guy, but I did see a Twitter post a few years ago that really crystallized my thinking about exactly this conditional versus unconditional way of thinking, which is that uh, this is from Laura Drenicor, who is at Princeton, that eliminating the correlation between things we care about and race is well-intentioned, but misses the mark. When we focus on the unconditional gaps between individuals arbitrarily classified with different groups, these gaps tell us what we need to know, which is that racial domination has produced categories with consequences. So I think we learn about racism from these unconditional gaps and not the other way around. So I'm out of time. I'll leave it there. Great paper. I hope it changes how you think about using these algorithms, but I also hope that all hope is not lost.